Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. And uh, this is a show which uh, you've asked for. You know, the, the three top subjects that come to us, uh, really, I, people ask us a lot of questions about healthcare, but it's always cancer, cardiac health, and really the third issue is uh, an operative thing. And a lot of people want to know about minimally invasive surgical techniques. Well, one of these individuals is going to talk to us about minimally invasive surgical technique. And, uh, and I, in fact, both of you are. So let me uh, have the opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Henry Kuzner, uh, who's an interventional cardiologist. And he's with the Heart and Health Institute at Westside Regional right here in Plantation. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you, sir. Good to have you. Thank you. And Dr. Jeffrey Newman, uh, who is a cardiothoracic uh, vascular surgeon. Uh, and he uh, works uh, often with uh, Dr. Kuzner. Uh, and you also at Westside Regional, correct? Correct. And you both have offices uh, somewhere right within the vicinity of that hospital. Within walking distance of the walking hospital. Walking distance, if you're anxious enough to cross the traffic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Kuzner, uh, what is an interventional cardiologist? So um, it's a person who does a lot of training. I have to start with that. You do uh, internal medicine, then you do cardiology, and then you do interventional cardiology. And once you get to all that training, you learn the skills to be able to take care of um, arteries that are blocked. You can also do uh, different procedures like uh, atrial septal closure, favuloplasties. There's uh, multiple procedures that, that we actually do. Um, most of it is done through a very small hole. The, the hole is about two millimeters most of the times. When we started training, and I'm talking about 15 years ago, most of it was happening through the femoral artery. Now we're switching mostly to the radial artery, which is at the wrist. And that's pretty amazing because the patients actually can walk immediately after the procedure is done. Mm. Well, that's terrific. Uh, you can't believe how many times people have asked us about uh, stents right. and uh, which is the change in what is happening relative to what you're going to talk about, Dr. Newman. Uh, is cardiothoracic uh, surgery. Correct. So, Dr. Newman? So I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. I uh, operate on the heart and lungs, and including uh, coronary bypass surgery and valvular heart surgery procedures. And we're also doing lung resections for basically cancer of the lung. And each one of those uh, procedures, we're able to very often minimize the trauma to the chest wall with, uh, with uh, thoracic or lung surgery, able to use uh, robotic assisted surgery, limiting the incisions to uh, less than an inch in length and uh, getting patients out of the hospital in a much faster time period and limiting their pain postoperatively. Additionally, we're also reducing the size of our incisions and location of the incisions for valvular heart surgery. Uh, now we're able to do isolated aortic or mitral valve operations with a uh, three or four inch incision on the side of the chest wall rather than doing a uh, full sternotomy. You know, it's amazing. Uh, and the reason why I mentioned uh, the, the top three subjects at the be beginning of the show is because the reason people ask about <clears throat> minimally invasive surgical techniques, they are always, and, and you've got to remember, these people that are out there are not physicians, dominantly, and they're, they're people who uh, have come to uh, this area or have been born in this area and want to live a nice, long, respectful life. And, you know, most people don't recognize the fact that we have the highest percentage of people over the age of 70, percentage-wise, in the United States, mm -hmm. of any state. And we have the highest number of people over the age of 85 that live in our state, of all the states in the Union. So you can understand, you know, there's a quality of life issue. And when people talk about minimally invasive surgical techniques, about what both of you do, they want to avoid, what you already said it, pain, blood, and cutting. Because in their minds, that means a lot of long hospital stay and a lot of pain. So you can understand why they ask. That's correct. Well, I think the key, at least in cardiac surgery, when we're uh, doing minimally invasive surgery, the key is to make sure that we're going to fix the heart and make the heart better than it was before they went to the operating room. Just having a small incision doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be better after surgery. 
However, if assuming that the operation can be done with the same facility through a small incision, the patient will benefit and be better after surgery. Let me ask you a question while, uh, before I get to, back to Dr. Kuzner. Uh, there's a lot of communication with us <clears throat> about uh, the surgical techniques, which are rather new, I guess you could say, in replacing uh, the valves, the cardiac valves. You want to talk a bit about that? Sure. Uh, the, the, the design of valves, at least in the aortic position, are, have been basically the same for the last uh, 20 to 30 years. They've advanced in the sense that they're more durable and we more often use tissue valves for surgical aortic valve replacement. In the mitral position, most often we're able to repair those valves. So somebody comes in with a leaky mitral valve, at least uh, 80 to 90 percent of the time that valve will be repaired versus replaced. And in general, the heart likes it better if you're able to put the valve back to its uh, way Mother Nature created it rather than just uh, sew a new prosthetic valve in its position. So in an oversimplistic way, what the, the people out there want to know, when you replace, for example, a leaky valve, right. what you're doing is you're allowing more blood to be retained in certain sections of the heart and then it works better. Correct. In general, the blood's supposed to pass one way through a heart. If a valve's leaking, that's putting pressure on the wrong side of the valve. So uh, the blood's not moving efficiently through the heart in a one-way direction. Okay. Dr. Kuzner, uh, I'm always amazed at the interventional techniques that have been, I guess, they're really new to medicine, but in a sense, Although interventional radiology has been around for a long time, right. orthopedics and things of that nature. But, you know, it really is amazing to me that, uh, and it comes from the people out there, because you used to hear all the time about, you know, bypass surgery, quadruple bypass, triple bypass, et cetera, et cetera. But the combination of knowledge that comes sitting in front of me here averts a lot of that because of, number one, interventional cardiology and then technique in case you need to be called in to make a repair, correct? Correct. correct. So t let's talk a bit about interventional technology. So um, particularly the, cardiology. The, so the most common thing that we're doing nowadays is uh, you place, uh, if somebody has a significant blockage in one of the arteries, which is causing significant chest pain or shortness of breath, we come in and as I said before, we go through the radial artery, which is right here at the wrist. We do the diagnostic procedure, which is taking the initial pictures. And uh, after that, you decide if you, need, you can do a stent or not. Um, since uh, 2003, we have newer generation stents, which is really probably the biggest change in cardiology. The reason why I say that is because with the old stents, the chances of the stent failing was about 30%. With the newer generation stents, the chances of failure anywhere between 3 and 4%. So, and when I mean failure is that the, the stent actually overgrows again the bad tissue that we had before. So with these new stents, we rarely have to go back in to fix them. Many times uh, we, we find really difficult blockages in complete occlusions of the artery and we can now manipulate certain uh, wires and catheters through to get that, that specific stent across. And once we open it up, then patients feel significantly better. I recall uh, we, had, we had one case not too long ago of uh, some gentleman that they tried seven times to open up this artery and actually I have to admit I tried once without knowing that somebody had tried six times before and uh, eventually I said to the, to the gentleman let me try one more time because I'm going to use some different different options so we used a different technique and uh, came back to the office and said you know you changed my life I can't believe what I can do now that I couldn't do before we open up this artery and it was a, a complete occlusion of the right coronary artery many times you say oh it's not a big deal he can live like that well he came back saying he couldn't live like that and he saw the, the huge difference after that. Well, you know, uh, you, you just touched something that uh, I, I usually don't talk about on the show. But, you know, a lot of people say uh, they, they, they enjoy the show because of the information they get. Uh, because really, they're, you're answering their questions. The value of what you say and what you say here today is going to reflect upon the people that are out there and maybe we will save a life or make someone's life better. So I want you to know how so thankful I, I am. I can tell you a quick have. story that last, uh, last week, we had a, two weeks ago, we had a, a patient that came to me for clearance prior to shoulder surgery. And his symptoms were every time he w went swimming, after 25 uh, laps, he would get this severe pain in his shoulder. 
So he says to me, you know, I came, I came to you to clear me. So I knew the guy from before and he had bad disease. So we do a stress test. He fails the stress test, lousy. So we put him on the cat table. A couple of days later, we find that the LED is completely occluded. So, you know, I say to the guy, you know, maybe a bypass is an option. I was going to call Jeff. And the guy says, listen, I'm a young guy. I know, and he actually knows me from Colombia still, long time ago. And uh, he says, can you do anything to try to prevent the bypass? I said, let me give it a try. So we put a wire, balloon, dun, dun, stents. Everything came out really nice. Guy leaves, comes back a week later and says, I don't think I need shoulder surgery anymore. I can swim 50 laps now, no, no problem. Well, so that, the, the, the shoulder surgery was a whole other ball game. Well, it does. I mean, you know, people don't. Firstly, I always say to people, you hear me say at the end of the show, I want them to take good care of themselves. But please talk to your doctors. Please. 100%. The doctors are there because they, they want to prepare you for the life that you want to live. Mm -hmm. All right? And a lot of times people say, oh, I have this pain, or I had, you know, this, this terrible gas, and I had my, my, my wrist was numb, but my hand wasn't numb. And I always, you know, I always refer to my guests' comments. But it also goes the other way, too. Uh, very often I get referred patients for surgery, and I'll talk to the patient. It might be a, this 70-year-old male man, and the wife's there, and you say, well, so what's going on? Well, nothing. I got a positive stress test, and you start asking. And all of a sudden, the patient starts saying, yeah, you know, I feel kind of funny if I do this, this, and this. And he never told his wife. Then it starts a discussion between the wife and the, and, and the husband about why didn't you say anything that was going on. Or, or for that matter, if they have uh, diabetes, very often they don't have any symptoms of uh, chest pain. And they're wondering why they're, seeing, you know, why they're seeing a cardiologist, let alone having a heart surgeon talk to them about bi potential bypass surgery. So uh, it, it, yeah, people have to be attuned to their body and how they're feeling and not just chalk it off to getting older. Dr. Newman, uh, the, the issue of, uh, of, uh, of survivability is, is, has been dramatic in your field. I mean, it is, the percentage of survivors is huge compared to what it was 15 years ago. Correct. Well, I think that's uh, due to our ability to uh, fix the problem within the heart with limited uh, morbidity to the patient and relative, uh, I'm going to say, and, and with, not, I wouldn't say relative ease, but relative uh, facileness in the sense that we, we, we know exactly what needs to be fixed and we can do it uh, relatively quickly. So, so in the process of fixing the heart, the heart doesn't suffer any damage. Uh, and that's been advanced tremendously over the last 25 years to the point where as recently as 1976, we, it was difficult to operate on the heart because we didn't have a, an easy way of, I'm going to use the word arrest or stop the heart during the surgery uh, and, and ensure that it was going to come back once we got done. Over the, since 1976, that, that's turned around, whereas we can stop the heart for up to two, three hours and the heart still comes back and works the way it's supposed to as long as we fixed it during the operation. And this, this is in relatively short, order, short amount of time. I, I refer a lot of my patients to Dr. Newman right. uh, when we find issues that we cannot fix ourselves right. or that we actually feel that are better fixed by Dr. Newman. And many times when, when I'm right after I finish the procedure, I'm talking to a patient and the family, they say, so what's my chances? 50-50? And I look at them and I'm like, you lost your mind? It's better than 96%. And they, they, like, they cannot believe it. They, they're like, no way, surgery? And I'm going to be 96% chance I'll be fine? Yes, 96% chance you're going to be fine. And, you know, even, even uh, Jeff would say, if it's above 10%, he may not do it at all. Because right. he doesn't want to take the, the, the risk of the mortality. Right. The lion's share of heart surgery we do, the risk to the patient is in the range of 1 to maybe 3%. Right. So it's a 97 to 99% chance they're going to do okay, more than okay. They're going to feel better once they heal up. Uh, and then you have to look at what the natural history of their process is. If we don't operate on them, it's certainly a lot higher than that. So those are the odds. And I, and I always tell patients there's no 100% in this world. But anything we do has a certain amount of risk, whether it's just the risk of anesthesia or the risk of something untoward happening. Well, getting back to my very first, uh, I guess, uh, practical comment that I always make to the, the viewers, and that is that, you know, you're, you're increasing the risk by not communicating. I mean, if they never get to you, sure. what is the risk? That's so true. It's so high, it's, so high, it's beyond belief. So really, the, it, the, the burden, I believe, even though you have the, the professional skills and expertise, is in the hands of the patient, not withholding 
themselves from your care, number one. And I understand the barriers often, you know, the finance barriers, the, 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 the family barriers, the living conditions. But really, if you really try to get through it and get to the care of healthcare professionals as skilled as both of you are, and to the Heart and Health Institute at Westside Regional, they're going to live a much more profitable life. That's true. I, I think the gatekeeper it has to be beyond, it's not the healthcare system, it's just getting yourself to, whether it's an emergency room or to a physician that can help you. Absolutely. And then, and then things will move along as needed. Well, you know, most people don't realize that uh, to do open heart or cardi cardiac surgery requires approval by the state, all right, in a sense. Uh, it's a, it's a, an application, which we call certificate of need application. Right. But what people don't know is that you cannot do, for example, there cannot be interventional cardiology without having someone back, to back up Dr. Kuzner. Dr. Kuzner cannot do his work without Dr. Newman around. That's true. Mm -hmm. Correct? And many times when I, uh, when I want to do a case that I don't feel comfortable, I, I mean, I, there may be a, an outcome that may not be perfect. I usually call Dr. Newman and say, are you around? So he would say, what's going on? So I usually tell him about the case and at least we have a backup system ready to go just in case something goes wrong. Well, I would assume you have both have teams. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that's why the communication is huge. We're, you know, when I'm doing something that I, you know, most of the cases are going to go in, card in interventional cardiology are going to go fine. But there's that 1% case that you say, mm, I'm not sure that this is going to go the way, the way it's going to go. And I usually communicate with him before I start. So they have their team ready and they have the, you know, the, whole, the whole setup available just in case we need them. Which is actually... It brings to the point how interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery are coming closer together in 2018, whatever Correct. year in, because we're now doing what's the so-called transcatheter aortic valves, which require yeah. both the surgeon and the, uh, and and the interventional cardiologist at the field together, uh, using, uh, I'm going to say, the best, uh, using their minds together and to thread a valve up from the groin or from the shoulder and position in the aortic position which requires both the uh, surgeon and interventional uh, skill set to do this. So I think the, the field is becoming more and more, I wouldn't say narrowed, but more and more joined at the hip. So they're actually, people are, we're actually working together in the, uh, in the cath lab or the interventional suite. Well, I always felt that intellectually you were together. It's just that physically sometimes they, it was not when they were laid out. For example, even the new ORs that are being created, they're, they're hybrid ORs, which, which make it much easier for not only you and your teams together, but wh whoever are the support units that are around, whether they be the, the specialty uh, uh, critical care nurses and the surgeon, surgeon nurses and, and all the other people that are involved, the, the PAs that are there and everybody. But here you have these, these units that are being created. You don't have one, two, three, four, five OWAs. You have to transfer, transfer, transfer. Now you have this beautiful, I believe, to me, in my mind, it's beautiful. It in my mind, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Right? You know, it's, it's wonderful because there's a lot of things going on between uh, imaging techniques, whether it's uh, ultrasound of the heart, which would be transesophageal echo, or uh, cath, which is uh, imaging of the arteries, of both the coronary arteries and the, uh, the extremities coming up so we can thread uh, these devices through uh, natural pathways within the body and then have uh, the technology, we take, care, take advantage of the technology to position a valve without actually making any, uh, I'm gonna say, real incisions in, in, the, uh, in the patient's body. It's, it's, it's really an advance. People will be surprised how many times we call each other to our, our own rooms, because I work in the cath lab and he works in the OR. Right. But many times I'm in the middle of one of my procedures and I'm like, somebody call Jeff and see if he, he can help me out here. He comes, show, you know, he comes in, walks in, I show him the pictures and he says, well, I'm not sure that you want to do this one. I'm like, no, that's exactly why I called you, because I think he better would be with you, but I don't want to stop until I spoke to you. So, you know, we put a balloon pump, or we put this, or put some support device, and then he'll take the patient to the OR later in the same day. And the other way around, he's doing a procedure, and he calls me in and says, hey, you know, we didn't know this valve was that bad. You mind look, taking a quick look at it? And again, we're looking through the transesophageal cardiogram pictures, and, you know, good enough. The valve is bad enough. You should probably fix it at the same time you're there. So we're well, talking to each other all the time. It's like... Yeah. People, people don't realize, but, but we probably talk two, three times a day. I'd like to ask you, both of you, number one, just general patients. I would assume most of the people are referred 
through the primary care physicians, internal medicine, et cetera, et cetera, to your people. Uh, the general cardiologists, et cetera, comes, it gets to you. Uh, how often should our viewers see a doctor? I would say primary care at least once a year, right. just to discuss how they're feeling, what's going on, maybe some general lab work. I, just the process of talking to a physician, a physician will bring up, uh, you know, have you had your PSA checked? Have you had uh, colonoscopy, for instance? Are you having, how are you feeling? Are you short of breath? What are you doing? E even listening to the patient about how active they are today compared to what it was, say, a year or two or four years ago. So once a year would be a good interval, especially if uh, patients are relatively healthy and have no ongoing real issues. You bring an interesting point, which is uh, probably talking about the preventive task force. Yes. And uh, news came out last week, for example, that your colonoscopy should start at the age 45. Right. Now, you used to be age 50, so in my case, I'm already past. But, <laughs> but um, I mean, I will be turning 50 later. But uh, the point is that cardiology-wise, there's not a lot into the preventive task force environment, mostly checking your cholesterol, and that's about it. You don't even, I mean, EKG people do, but there's not even in the, in the preventive guidelines. So many times I, I get a patient and says, I'm coming here for my, my yearly stress test, and uh, you have disease. No, I don't have any disease. So, so why are you doing a yearly stress test? Well, I was doing it for years. When well, in reality, you don't have to do it if you have no symptoms. Now, different to the patient that comes in and says, I'm having this severe shortness of breath every time I walk a block. That's a guy who probably doesn't need a stress test. But in the, in the task force and the preventive task force, there's nothing really involving cardiology as, as of today. What I would like to hear is just, because you, you mentioned diabetes before. Diabetes is so concomitant with, with heart disease. That's it's correct. unbelievable. Sure. But, you know, there's a lot of things. I mean, please re refer, because we're down to the last four minutes of the show, about exercise and, and not being sedate and, 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 and health intake, uh, you know, health uh, nutrition intake, et cetera, et cetera. Can any of well, you Well, I, I think that's why uh, people should see their primary care, to get on that, to have that discussion and have their blood sugar checked and then how sedentary they may or may not be, where, where their weight's going. I, I, I think that part of the natural process of aging is as we get older, we get more sedentary. So we gain weight and, and that causes our blood sugar to get out of control and our blood pressure goes up. So again, seeing a physician or a primary care once a year can play into that kind of thing so people remain more active and keep their normal weight going and at least at the very least intervening when they see things are getting out of control and some one, that one doesn't of the things in cardiology to blood pressure control right and uh, why do we call the silent killer hypertension because many people don't even know they have high blood pressure until they show up in the hospital with a major complication being bad kidney being a bleed in the brain or you know there's multiple complications from this. And I, I tell you, you have to go see your doctor at least once a year, absolutely. But what's the big problem when you walk into the, in any of the stores next door, and I don't want to make, make any commercials to them, right. they have a blood pressure machine right there. Put your arm in there, check it. Well, what, what is it, 180. Maybe I should go see my primary right away. Because yeah. many times you don't realize your blood pressure starts climbing as you get older. Right. And next thing you know, you're gonna have a bleed in the brain or a major complication from, from high blood pressure. Well, the other thing is, and, and uh, a very uh, well-known colleague of yours was sitting right there, like I said, and we were talking about it, and he, he said that, that, you know, what they call exercise, which is not necessarily, you know, running around the, the street, but, you know, walking, don't, don't be sedentary, and hydration. He was very big with hydration because in South Florida, you just do not realize how warm it is and how difficult it is when you lose your, your body fluids, correct? I Correct. It, it hurts your kidneys. It hurts. Uh, you lose energy. And we we'll say at least once, probably at least once uh, every other week, somebody who comes in severely dehydrated. They were outside doing garden work, who knows what, and next thing you know, they passed out. They come into the hospital. We check their kidneys. They're shot. Yeah. And the reason why is because they didn't take good care of their hydration. Yeah. Not yeah. part of the heart, but you know, it's still part of the. No, but it all, it all leads to, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we're very pleased, and we're down to the last one minute of the show. We're very pleased to have Dr. Kuzner and Dr. Newman in our community, and we thank you, not only for your capabilities, but for your advocacy. I can just feel it here. I can feel how you really do go beyond your skill uh, because the patient is so important to you. And I, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the people out here 
and the, the people who either are patients or the people who will be patients or the people who will never be patients. <laughs> the, the reality is, is that the reason we had this show is to try to answer questions from the people out there. You've answered the questions, but I want to thank you both. And uh, I, want to, I want to tell everybody again that Dr. Henry Kuzner is an interventional cardiologist. He's with the Heart and Health Institute at Westside Regional. And Dr. Jeffrey Newman is a cardiothoracic vascular surgeon also affiliated with uh, Westside Regional. And uh, you both can be reached. Uh, you have offices. We'll put your telephone numbers up. You don't have to repeat them now. We'll put them right under you. So if people want to see you, then that's up to them. Thank you. Uh, but I would uh, say thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, Westside Regional. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kuzner, Dr. Newman. And remember, folks, as I always tell you, and you've heard it repeated twice here by these two healthcare professionals, you've got to see your doctor. And don't be silent. Tell the doctor about the over-the-counter preparations you're telling, taking. Tell them about the so-called nutraceuticals and the, you know, the supplements that you're taking. You have to let them know. So please, please take good care of yourself. This show is called Dateline Health, and you know that we have this telephone number and email right here. If you have any questions, just uh, dial us up or give us the question, and if you have any ideas for another show, let us know. My name is Fred Lippman. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. Until next time, 